Hello, I'm Nicholas. I'm part of the What's Going On Right Now channel team and the documentary team, which are both part of our PBL. One team, I showcase events in Taipei and in the documentary team, I'm helping direct both an eight minute video and a 30 minute video based around PBL in general. And hello, my name is Catherine. This semester, we have been working on the project called Yes Radio, which is a YouTube channel providing videos and broadcasting. And the topics cross over music, vlogs, interesting events, and history in Taipei. I'm working on a personal project called Her Story under VS Radio. It is a channel that tells the stories of impactful female figures throughout history. And today we are going to talk about project-based learning with Kyle Wagner, who is the professional PBL coach from Transfer Educational Teaching. We are really excited to have him here. Last year, I had a great opportunity to work Kyle through our exhibition when I worked as a designer in Taipei Design Group, which is one of the PBL projects at VIS at Better World Lab Experimental School. So let's welcome Kyle here. All right, yeah, welcome nice Kyle. to be here. Yeah, we're Thank happy you. to have you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, probably the, the, the stuff that people want to know has to do with PBL and education. Um, but I, uh, I like to tell people first, I'm a quadruplet, which is kind of an, an interesting fact about me. It means I have three brothers, my uh, same age, we were all born at the same time, which is a lot more interesting, I think, than talking about education for some people. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, what I tell people in terms of education is I, I label myself a, a co learning experience designer. Um, I like to support schools, uh, forward thinking educators develop uh, social, emotionally, global aware citizens such as yourselves. Um, through project-based um, experiences. And, you know, I think of it as like a bicycle. Um, if you think of a bicycle as having two sets of gears, um, the large sets of gears is, of course, you know, making kind of a big, big change when it comes to, you know, how um, rapidly you're, you're pedaling the bicycle. And sometimes it's, you know, it's slower to, to make those changes. That's a big lever. And that's from the school-wide level on how to allow for project-based experiences, um, which includes curriculum, grading policies, timetabling, these kind of things. And then the smaller levers are, of course, the classrooms um, that are enacting those changes, the experiences that are happening, which is, you know, the work on the ground, um, which can happen a lot more rapidly. It's a lot easier to switch gears on a bicycle when you're switching the small gears. And uh, those are things like um, you know, implementing the experiences, instructional practices, learning opportunities, these kind of things. Um, so that's kind of what I do. I work now with um, around 15 different schools um, spread across the world. And, you know, I've now had the opportunity to help, uh, you know, a thousand educators, um, you know, co-design experiences and implement them with learners like you, uh, including the IS. It's really nice to know more about you. And I can tell that you are really passionate about like designing learning and also the project based learning. So I was wondering if you could describe the benefits of project based learning compared to traditional classroom teaching. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there's a, a lot of benefits. Um, you know, you guys have have experienced it firsthand, I think, as well. Right. Um, how long have you, you been at DIS? Uh, both of you, Nicholas, Christina? Three years. Uh, it's my second year and I'm almost, I'm a senior, I'll graduate. Well, I think no two years. Yeah. Okay. We, we both came at the same time. <laughs> okay. Nice. Nice. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing the benefits firsthand just in the way kind of you guys are conducting yourselves. Um, very professional, right? You have a VIS radio. Um, even beforehand, you know, your, your teacher, Byron, um, mentioned to me, Hey, you guys have been preparing all week, um, for this. Uh, I don't know whether or not that's, that's true. But I think one of the benefits is just this level of engagement. Um, you know, obviously, you're going to be a lot more motivated and engaged when you have a bit of say and voice in the kind of learning experiences that are taking place. In this case, is the VIS radio. And you have an immediate audience that you're sharing that with. Um, you know, I hope your, your audience is uh, pretty wide and far reaching. Um, but that's going to motivate you, hopefully, to do better. And I've seen this as a benefit directly. Is just first is student engagement. Um, and motivation. I've seen schools that has very low attendance rates. Um, right now, there's chronic absenteeism, especially after this whole, you know, COVID pandemic, where kids are like not wanting to come to school, because, you know, it's back to pounding books and taking exams, which is not necessarily what kids want to do. I don't think that's what's going on at VAS and not at the schools that implement PBL. So it's, you know, it benefit is high engagement. Um, another way it benefits students is in terms of skills, you know, what you guys are doing right here, it's communication. Um, you know, you guys are having to collaborate and coordinate on this uh, radio station. You're having to find people to interview. You're having to edit. 
um, episodes, probably conduct in a professional way. So, you know, that's kind of a skill that you're not going to get by sitting at a desk. Um, and that also, you know, ties into when we talk about future skills. And, you know, I, we always talk about your guys' future, right? Okay, this is what kids are going to need um, in the future, you know, five, 10 years from now. And you guys are probably sick of hearing that, I'm sure, from, hey, in five or 10 years, here's what you're going to need. You guys, you're like, hey, we're living this right now. Why can't we actually start doing some of these things? And, you know, I think the benefit is the skills that we talk about, um, integration of technology. Um, I think, you know, products that you guys are creating um, that are making the world a better place, you know, that's a benefit of PBLs, those skills. And the last one I want to discuss is the uh, social kind of emotional, mental wellness. Um, this is huge. You know, we talk about well-being of learners and, you know, we have certain things that we're doing to increase learners' well-being, but I'll give you a story. Um, there's a curriculum that was handed to this teacher um, who was a makerspace type teacher. She's always hands-on and she was given this social emotional curriculum that was handed to her and said, deliver this to students. And it's very much like a textbook, right? You're like, okay, here are your different levels of well-being. Here's what you have to do to be well. And it was almost like dictated, like let's lecture students um, into their social emotional well-being. She scrapped that and instead engaged the students in designing um you know, therapy types of therapeutic types of toys and therapeutic uh, methods for the elementary school. So our high school students were tasked to develop these and really develop a bit of a whole room that is dedicated to social emotional wellness. Well, lo and behold, our students immediately perked to life. They were excited. They're engaged. Um, they formed different teams. Um, they designed all sorts of things. Um, they designed different characters that would help them you know, when they felt stressed um, out, they had a question box that came to, you know, questions, you know, learners had or things they wanted to share. So, you know, this is just a story anecdote to show the benefits of, you know, when projects are the driving force, all those attributes we hope to have in students, um, we start to see. So I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. Because usually when you go to like the real world, a lot of like office jobs, they require mainly collaboration and i feel like traditional school they don't really prepare you for that level of collaboration within teams like how to manage how to allocate tasks and i actually agree like pbl does quite a lot of that and also i was wondering uh, how can a school balance teaching content knowledge and uh, developing a 21st century skills through like uh, pbl projects yeah that's a good question yeah i would love to unpack a little bit more too of, of what you just mentioned um in terms of the way the real world works right in terms of teams uh when i interview you guys about like some of your projects so we'll hear that uh, hopefully a little later but i think the balance of content and skills is a tricky one i will say it's not easily done um if you lean too much on the content side of things um then you know students feel very forced to learn this content and not necessarily you know producing an authentic product it's more of just regurgitation of the knowledge that they learned so let's say for example you know you're learning about communication and public speaking and you know you might put together a speech or a powerpoint of some sort but then that usually is for the teacher you know um we we ask students to do essays right and that's very content heavy and they might have researched a topic for a while and they produce an essay but they're not living it and then the skill side, you know, is the, is where you're actually living it, um, these kind of things out. But the problem sometimes when you lean too heavily on the skill side is that some of the content doesn't go as deep as possible. So, for example, if kids are making a documentary on, you know, some of the um, changes that might have happened in this whole digital space of COVID, or maybe they're uh, documenting a part of the city that hasn't been featured, you know, they might have some pretty cool flash photography or some, you know, flashy transitions. But perhaps the content piece is missing. And I think the way you balance that is uh, through two, um, what I will say is very simple ways. First, you want a challenging problem or question that's going to engage learners. Okay. And a lot of people start projects with just a, a take home kit. You know, I've seen so many STEM kits where it's just like step A, step B, step C. That is not going to engage learners and really help balance content skills. So you start with the challenging problem or question. So, for example, you know, we were doing one um, around the water quality uh, in Beijing, and it was a local waterway we were looking at. The question we engaged learners in was, you know, how do we use data to make an improvement on a local waterway? 
And every student came up with a different way in which they're going to answer that question. But the fact that we ask them a challenging question with data involved means that they're going to have to get into some rigorous science kind of content um, when it comes to the water quality, analyzing that, synthesizing their data, coming to conclusions, that ensures the rigor, right? The content that, that schools really want to have. Now, the skill side of things obviously is going to come in the interviews they're going to conduct, um, how they're going to communicate their results, how they're going to prototype, create their innovations and inventions. And so, so that's first, create a really authentic um, question, problem, or challenge. Second part is to think of an authentic product, you know, and who those students are going to share that with is the second part of this piece. Now, you guys, I know, do all these ex exhibitions um, and you exhibit your work to audiences, which is great because that is what's going to hopefully give you the impetus to do really great work that's going to balance content and skills. But what I always tell people to do is to think of the audience and is it the relevant audience for what project or product that you are producing. So for example, in this project, kids had to present to environmental engineers because they're gonna give them feedback on their innovations. They had to present to the community that lived next to the waterway. When they're doing a business project, you know, they had to pitch to entrepreneurs to get their investment. They're not pitching to teachers. They're not pitching to, you know, the parents. And the parents, because the parents, you guys probably know, are gonna go, hey, great job, well done. You know, give you a pat on the back. So, I, you know, I tell people, that the second part of it, come up with a challenging problem or question, give students a real audience, real professionals, help them to think like real professionals. Um, and that whole gap that is created by the question and who they're going to present to is where all the content and skills come in. And that's going to ensure that you have that balanced. So I hope that helps answer that question. Okay, thank you very much. And for this question, I have my, some personal opinions because I'm doing the personal project in VS Radio. And I really learned that how to balance the content knowledge and also de developing skills in the PBL because I'm doing like the herstory con contents and I have to do a lot of research. And also I basically writing the whole essay for my scripts. And yeah. during the process i also learned how to manage my own workflow and mm. also how to do all the audios and also making the videos for myself and mm. my another question is i would like to ask you maybe like emphasize three important skills that students can learn from ppl that can actually prepare themselves for the real world mm. Yeah. So first of all, I just you know want to applaud you for the the skills that you're gaining doing VIS radio, and I'm sure that you know the editing and everything else was is it was it exciting uh, to to learn those new skills? I mean, how did you gain those skills? Did you ask someone? Did you look up YouTube videos? <laughs> so we have the teachers like Nick and Byron. They will teach your house to like do the marketing or do all the like audio sounds work. So we basically will receive some like slides and. Basically, teachers had to do it and some assignments to guide us through it. Excellent. Yeah, so that's great. They helped fill in the gap of, of your 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 needs for learning, right? Where you can learn a bit on your own. And you can also get this help from, from mentors, uh, which is a great lesson for people probably listening to this. Um, you know, the three, the three skills that you mentioned um, or you asked about, I, we shared a little bit about those earlier, but I will kind of talk a little bit about these um, future skills. Um, you know, there's a large... Uh, panel that got together, I think it was the World Economic Forum, and they get together and come up with what are the 10 future skills, uh, future ready skills that learners are going to need. Now, we've heard this old adage, I'm sure your parents have probably told you this, but half the jobs they say that exist today aren't going to exist right in the future. And I can see you kind of smiling because you probably heard this ad nauseum, um, which is true. I mean, Jobs are changing at such a rapid pace with the onset of AI, new technologies, the way, you know, in which the whole global community gets together. Now you aren't competing just with the people, you know, um, in your city for jobs. You're competing with people all across the world. So, I mean, that's the impetus to talk about why, um, you know, we need new skills. And they talk about the skills. I'll, I'll list a couple of them. They talk about adaptability, creativity, active learning, critical thinking, um, working in a team. And, you know, all of those skills are ones that you can gain, you know, through project-based experiences. Um, so this whole idea of, you know, adaptability, um, you know, a great 
uh, example of adaptability, how you get that through a project-based experience is, you know, how you have to continuously change the product that you might be developing um, based on, you know, audience feedback. That is a, a way that you have to be adaptable. Um, you have to be adaptable with timelines, right? Um, you know, sometimes you you find out a timeline doesn't work. Uh, in your VIS radio, I'm sure you probably come across a guest maybe that you had to have and something came up, right? You had to be adaptable, um, you know, in that particular project. I saw two students. One was very academic focused and we had a project where they're developing their own business. And the one who was highly adaptable, who constantly changed their idea of what their business was going to be week in and week out, was far more successful. And they actually ended up developing this business where all they were doing is producing better card holders for these kids' cards, you know, their ID cards, because they're always breaking. And they did leaps and bounds better than a, one team that decided they're going to do a board game. Now, they wanted this board game. They had this concept, and it was kind of a cool concept. Everyone loves board games, but they never went and got feedback. They never went and asked people what kind of board game they want. They just developed this in isolation. And then at the end, the only person who buy the board game was the teachers because we felt bad for them. So, you know, this whole notion of adaptability is one of the great skills that you're going to get if you really undergo a project-based experience that you're not going to um, get, you know, if you're sitting down at a table, we talked a bit about working on a team. I'm sure in VIS radio, you have your various teams, whether it's, do you guys have different teams like the marketing team or what are the different teams you guys have on your radio? Oh, uh, we have the marketing team, the radio team, uh, the documentary team, manager team. Yeah. And I'm another team. I'm just personal project. Yeah. This is a secondary team. And we also separate a primary team, which is the creating contents like we have different topics under different teams like hmm. what genre is making music and what's going on right now is talking about like interesting events in taipei and also taipei explorer is like introducing the history and also some place to go in taipei and another is vi's vlogs hmm. yeah like uh, what you said about how um there's more feedback in like pbl uh, learning systems i kind of agree because uh, in our like um, primary teams, we have like YouTube views, like they can kind of give us feedback on like what works and what doesn't work. And I can like kind of like push us to improve. Otherwise, if we were like isolated and we only showed it to teachers, I could like, you know, be kind of like different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. What what are, do you find anything with the YouTube views, like any trends? What what do people love the most? Um, they love uh, one team the most, uh, this um, Taipei Explorer. <laughs> Yeah, they usually go to like these uh, places, like these historical events. Okay. And you kind of like analyze like, oh, why? Why do they like that? And you like consider it. And yeah, it's quite okay. an like, adaptive system. Yeah, nice. I, I have to check that out. I'll give them another like and another view. Um, oh. But yeah, what, one of the things you mentioned was uh, with this, you know, in working in the teams is, and then getting feedback is this active learning, you know? Um, you're learning actively what people like, what people don't like, you know, you're getting this feedback, how you might change your, your show, how you might change your content. Um, so this kind of active learning uh, happens, as you know, right, through project-based experiences that doesn't necessarily happen in a traditional classroom. You're kind of passively learning, right? You're, you're hearing everything the teacher wants to deliver, and then you are then regurgitating that on some kind of test. So it's just like filling your head of knowledge and then dumping it, and then you move on, you forget about it, right? So... Those are, you know, those are a few of the, the kind of skills. Um, yeah, I think I think I answered most of that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I just will add that, um, you know, if we don't take this approach, I, I really think that there's there's far reaching repercussions if we don't take a more active approach to learning, um, because, you know, students are. Uh, even though you guys as learners will probably try to do a lot of those projects on your own outside of school. If you spend six, seven hours a day, you know, I, I talked to somebody who is creating this entire documentary um, uh, around, you know, bringing recess back and the whole idea of play because they learn to code in a language from a professor, by the way, um, that it was 10 years outdated. I mean, there's a whole new programming language and they were, learning a programming language from this professor who had not been at all in the field in the last 10 years. And that's 
a little bit dangerous when you think about you know these kids going out into a very very uh, competitive job market, you know, learning outdated you know kind of coding languages. <laughs> yeah. Oh, speaking of like outdated, uh, I have another question. So, how do you think uh, PBL will play a part in the future of uh, education? Because also, um, I've read like one study. It was kind of recent. Uh, it studied like how uh, students from traditional uh, education versus a PBL education, and they found that a lot of uh, the students in the PBL education they performed better, like in general, on like a lot of different um, aspects. So yeah, I think maybe PBL will start playing like a bigger part in the future of education. Would you say you agree with that? Um, I I w I wish. Uh, okay, so like the 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 optimist in me you know always like that's why we we do this work right that's why you have you know byron you have austin who's your other teachers by the way <laughs> nick byron. you said right yeah, nick. yeah yeah nick right i mean that's why we're in this field um and i think that's why a lot of educators to be honest get into educating right we we love to see young people shine so the optimist in me says these kind of data that data that comes out is going to change the game but the problem with that way of thinking is, is we're putting too much faith, I think, in this data because that data has been around for a while um, in that, you know, the, the outcomes that we want to see in learning, um, lo and behold, uh, we get better outcomes when we're allowing students to have more voice and choice, be more actively involved, making things more real world and meaningful. So I, I don't think it's going to disrupt large you know, education systems, there's way too much in place to, to start doing that. Um, you know, when you start really looking at the curriculum that they've been assigned, when you start looking at the schedules of six or seven periods a day, I know you guys have a project you get to work on for a semester and you have a very flexible schedule, right? And you have teachers that are very kind of adaptive and they work together. This is just not the case in many systems. So the optimist in me would say, I'd like to see the future of education really changing, but I think it's going to happen in small pockets in places like a VIS where you have some of these experimental models and then, you know, schools are going to borrow, I think, a little bit from those ideas. They might change. Maybe the end of unit um, is not going to be a paper pencil exam. It's going to be an alternative form of assessment. Some schools are going to get away from having mandated tests, right? And that's going to free up, I think, learners um, and free up some teachers to start you know, making things a little bit more relevant and meaningful. Um, so I think it's going to happen uh, in small pockets. And I also say that I think for the future of education to be impacted by this way of learning, um, we need to have more, I think, parents um, that are pushing for it um, and demanding it because, you know, I, probably your parents put you in a school like this, you know, because they wanted something that was different than, you know, traditional sit and get. And I think with the whole onset of COVID and parents, you know, kind of saw some of the, the issues with the education system, they're starting to become some more demand. So I think the parents have to be involved. I think schools have to be involved. I think state um, and, you know, country education boards have to be involved to give, you know, more autonomy to allow for this to happen. But I don't think it's going to be large sweeping change. I think it's going to happen in small pockets. Um, so that's my answer to that question. I think your answer is really perfect because before I go to VIS, I was studying in the traditional school and I really understand that their schedule is full, like six or seven, even eight classes a day. They will mm -hmm. have classes until 9 p.m. Wow, and 9 p.m. It's crazy and basically have tasks every week, every day. So I think that is one of the reasons why I want to break through and to embark into a different education because I want to, I also want to see something change in my or traditional classroom. So I was hoping myself can be a kind of model and bring this learning methods to more classroom. And Wonderful. I think at the end, you mentioned that, that many people have to involve with this to make big changes and mm -hmm. a very important thing is the students is also going to have to involve in this so mm -hmm. because they are really a very important role in education so if everyone involved in this i think future might be a lot of change 
So, yes. Yeah, I, I don't know how I missed that. <laughs> you, you guys are the number one. Yeah, the learners are involved in every single conversation, <laughs> for sure. So I think that's all about the today, and we're looking forward that this interview and will be really useful and for the people who don't know about project-based learning to have a better understanding of what PBL is and how to make learning different. And that'll be the end of this interview. Thank you very much yeah. for joining Thank this you. with me, with us. Yeah, thanks so much, Nicholas and Christina, for having me and uh, for your continued work and for you know getting the word out um, about these alternatives, uh, types of education. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you.